All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego and joining me from up the coast in Northern California and Sonoma is Seth Donlan. How are you doing, Seth? I'm well. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. And Seth uh, has a company, Arwin uh, Coaching, and um, you coach uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, some sports and fitness one, coaches, trainers, sports therapists, gym, studio, dojang, uh, dojo, sorry, I was using the Korean, dojo, or even dojang owners, sure. uh, to overcome their anxiety about networking, public speaking, managing teams, etc. And we want to talk today about public speaking and, and confidence and just how do you develop a level of confidence where you are able to get your message across, where you're able to feel confident in your message, where you're able to flex in, in particular situations, whether that be online here in Zoom or as we get back to more in, in person. So let's just um, start at the beginning. Seth, what is, from all the work you've done, Mm -hmm. What is the initial or fundamental fear that people have about public speaking? Yeah, fundamentally, I, I, it's, a, it's a fear of, um, it's a fear of judgment. It's a fear of ridicule, right? Human beings are social animals and we evolved, um, you know, we're, we're not an, a, you know, we are the apex predators, but we're not an apex predator the way the great white shark is, or, you know, a lion on the savanna is, um, you know, the male lions that are, that are, that are not the dominant lion in the pack that go off on their own, they, they survive quite well, but a human being on the savanna, you know, pushed out from the tribe did not s survive very well. And so we evolved in a way where we understood that that our um, social standing within the group was was hugely important to our survival, and now we're at a point right where where nobody's going to necessarily push us out of our society and in in such a way that we're going to that our lives are going to be at risk, but we still have that primal fear of. Um, being thought less of by the group. And it really shows up when, when we step out in front of people, whether it be on a, a physical stage or a virtual stage. And, you know, we, we risk letting people know what we think and where we really stand rather than playing it safe and, you know, kind of blending into the background. Yeah, no, it is it it is fast it it is fascinating. Mind you, there probably are some people who would like to kick some people out into the wilderness, but that's <laughs> yeah, another well, story that's... altogether. Um, but um, no, it it is fascinating about that is because um, we tend to, we we love and admire people who are good in like public speakers. A lot of people like you know wish oh I wish I could be like that, and and it, and it does I, and obviously like it it's a skill that can really serve you well. But it's a lot. I, I'm not. I'm not diminishing, you know, in any way. But it's. It is a lot easier than people think if they can get over the these initial obstacles. Sure, sure. I, you know, like many things in life, we get really concerned about. I mean, think. I mean, think even about walking. Right. Think about walking down the street, even if you're just walking down like a, a, a the sidewalk in a doesn't even have to be the biggest city in the world. But like, you know, a city where there's I, there's going to yeah. be eyes on you, not because they're necessarily watching you, but just because, you know, people look yeah. around and they see the other people that are walking down the street. If you start like getting into your own head and thinking like. Oh, well, do I look confident or, or do I look like a, a victim? Like I better I better walk a certain mm -hmm. way so that people trust me or fear me or whatever, right? Well, like walking is such a natural thing. And if you hadn't had that thought at all, you'd walk down the street very naturally, very confidently, very attractively, right? As soon as you get into your head and you start thinking about like, okay, well, how do I do this? Suddenly you're going to be like, you know, I mean, not yeah. that badly, but like, you're not going to walk down the street in that confident manner, in that attractive manner. Like, you're trying too hard at it. You're analyzing every little thing. And we don't, right? Like that's not the way that our brains work. We don't, we don't mm -hmm. walk well when we're, when we're putting our mind into every little muscle movement that we make walking down the street. 
And speaking is the same thing. If we are having a good conversation with a, with a friend of ours or something, we're incredibly like, um, you know, likable, uh, you know, empathetic, engaging, you know, like very few of us, except for those of us that have, suffer from super levels of so social anxiety. I suffer from, from generalized anxiety, luckily not of the level that I'm talking about, but most people, they don't have any problem talking with their friends and they can, they can be great speakers and very compelling, right? But then you get them up on stage and it's the same thing that yeah. I just described. Suddenly they're over analyzing every little detail and that's the kiss of death. That's where things fall apart. And then that's a, you know, that's that like re reinforcing loop of like things just get worse and worse and worse as you get more and more inside your own head. Yeah, and and it's it's interesting because uh, Seth and I we were just talking before coming on air a little bit about our shared love of martial arts, and it's funny because that is that is it's exact same scenario. It's when you get too much into your head, when you get when you start to think too much about what you're doing, overanalyze it. Suddenly, it's very hard to put some of these moves together because you're just thinking too much about it instead of letting it flow and like trying to relax. It's the same thing as you said for for public speaking is if you get if you overanalyze it if you get into your own head too much you overthink it suddenly you know there's you can you can invent all of these things that are going is that person looking at me funny is you know am i doing okay did they didn't laugh or whatever you know and, and suddenly every every you're looking for a thousand data points to prove your to yourself that you're failing right right and and you you get I mean, here's one of the big keys to public speaking. It's a mindset shift for most people. And it's that it seems very obvious that, you know, let's say there's 150 people in the audience. There's one speaker up on stage. Obviously, seemingly, obviously, the event, therefore, must be all about that speaker. There's 150 people looking at that one speaker, right? So the focus, mm -hmm. everybody's focus is on that speaker. Now that speaker is up there terrified, potentially, unless they're, you know, unless they're, they've, they've done this a lot, right? That speaker is up there terrified that they have 150 people focusing on them and that they're the focus and that everything and this whole thing is all about them. The reality is, you know, you can kind of flip your mentality around about that. The reality is, is that the, the event is not in fact about the speaker. The event is about the audience, right? The speaker is there to, to provide the audience with some value. And in fact, the audience is really not paying attention to the speaker nearly as much as the speaker thinks the audience is. <laughs> the audience is busy thinking about like, you know, oh, do I have like spinach in my teeth from the lunch mm -hmm. that I just ate. And when I, and when I accidentally bumped into my seatmate, are they now mad at me or like, <laughs> Oh my goodness, I forgot my notebook. Now I, now I'm not never going to remember, you know, like they, they're so busy thinking about their own lives and their own insecurities and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. They're paying attention to you, but they're not like laser focused on you analyzing your every little move and every little mistake and being like, Oh, mm -hmm. He said, um, <laughs> not a good public speaker, right? They've got way too much going on in their own head. And so when you start thinking about it like that way and you realize, wait a minute, it's not, the event is not about me, the speaker. The, ev the event is about providing value to the audience. So in fact, the speaker isn't the focus, the audience is the focus. And as a speaker, if you can come out on stage, again, whether, you know, stage can be video, if you sure. can come out on stage and realize, wait a minute, I am here to provide value to the audience. This is all about, the focus is really all on the audience. The more that you start focusing on the audience and you start you know, really focus on how do I help that audience? How do I provide greatest value to that audience? You don't have any time left you know, there, there's, there's not enough processing yeah. left in your brain for you to then worry about like, well, how am I standing? Do I look good? Am I, mm -hmm. you know, what, how's my posture? How's the tone of my voice? Like all the things that otherwise you might really be worrying about. Those all get pushed to the side. There's not, there's not enough space left in your brain when you focus on the audience and you focus on trying to provide them with value. No, abs absolutely. And I think the other thing that sometimes this is what I, the, I tell people when they're starting to get a bit freaked out though is, 
have you ever gone to see a, a, a speaker or a presentation or whatever and sat there and going oh i hope this guy sucks i really want to see him go down in flames i want to see a, i want to see a train wreck today i mean nobody does that so i always said to people is is when you get up there they they want you to be good right they're yeah. rooting for you right. so um so start with that that you actually have a, a room full of some people who are supportive yeah absolutely absolutely i mean i you know yeah we all know i mean we have a we have a whole media system that's like built around highlighting the the abnormal whether it's like yeah. an incredibly wonderful story or whether it's an incredibly like terrible story i mean you think about the 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 local news like you know any given night that you watch the local local news if you're if you live in a major metropolitan area there's probably some house fire right but like that house fire really isn't important to anybody but like that family, mm -hmm. the, the people that know them and maybe the, the few surrounding houses, but it's on the news and it makes you feel like, oh, there's house fires everywhere, right? <laughs> so, our, so our focus ends up being on the negative. And, and anyway, the, the, you know, we also focus a lot on the, on the bad players in our society, right? The, the mm -hmm. people that have done us wrong, the people that are doing society wrong. And, and it, when we start to get this like sense that there's, that that's, a, a much greater preponderance of our society than it actually is. The reality is most people are good people that only want good things for everybody else that they encounter in life. They're not out here to like judge us, to put one over on us, to try to like kick us when we're down. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's a mindset shift. It's like, look, expect good things of people. They, they will probably, yeah. right? They will, they, they, you will probably, if you expect good things of people, you will probably not be surprised, um, right? Because you'll probably end up, they'll end up being good to you. You'll yeah. occasionally be surprised by, you know, occasionally you're going to run into a, a nasty person, sure. but more, more than likely you're going to run into a bunch of good people. Yeah, but to your point, I mean, the chances of all those horrible people all showing up at the same time to the right. same presentation is pretty but slim. Right? Auditorium <laughs> full of terrible people. <laughs> Um, the other thing that uh, I think this, this is a really powerful one, I mean, I talk to a lot of people about this because not just in the context of public speaking, but in the context of, of you know, people going after bigger jobs or promotions or going out there on their own as entrepreneurs or whatever it is, and that's the imposter syndrome. Sure. And, and I think that is, so, it's such a powerful syndrome, if you like. But totally. it, it debilitates people so much. And I think and I think anybody who hasn't suffered from it a little bit um, is probably not telling you the truth. Right. Well, I, I mean, here's the thing. Here's a here's a really interesting thing to think about. Anybody that anybody that hasn't suffered from imposter syndrome probably is not an expert at anything or, or, you know what I mean? Like you may like yeah. not feel comfortable calling yourself an expert, but like they're not an expert or close to expertise level because you have the, uh, what is it? The, 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 the Dunning Kruger effect, or I, I may be massacring that, but there's the, there's the, there's the flip side of the coin to the, um, the imposter syndrome where, where people that don't know much about a subject, uh, you know, a skill, whatever, they will always overestimate their skill at that, their knowledge level at that. Then, you know, again, flip side back to imposter syndrome, it's not quite imposter syndrome, but people that know a lot about a subject, they know that they know a lot, but they also know that there's so much more out there that they could know that they start underestimating what they know and the, and the value of their knowledge, right? So when we actually become subject matter experts and we're in a position that, that, you know, we'd be doing the world a disservice if we don't go out and give up our expertise, but suddenly we're at a level where we know there's so much more for us to know. And now we feel like, oh, well, I don't know enough that I can go out there and tell people things. So, we, you know, like when you start feeling imposter syndrome, that's just, that's like actually, that's actually almost a hundred percent fail safe proof that you actually know quite a bit and you should be out there you know, giving of it. The other thing is, you know, the other thing that I think of is um, not everybody's an entrepreneur, clearly, but in the, mm -hmm. you know, in the entrepreneurial world, 
regardless of what business you're creating, you know, you said, I work with a lot of sports and fitness professionals, you know, a personal trainer is opening up a new, you know, personal training, training business. It, you know, they, they're not inventing personal training, yep. but they're creating their business where there was not one before. And though like 95% of what they're doing is going to be essentially just like their competitors, there's that 5% that they are putting their own spin on it. They're creating something that hasn't been created before. The only way that you can do that, literally the only way that you can do that is to make, to literally make it up as you go along. You try, you, you, you make it up, you try something, mm -hmm. hopefully you succeed. Oftentimes you fail, you iterate, you move forward, right? But you're always, and, and if your business, if you're not trying new things, if, right, in your business, your business is, is not growing. And so any successful entrepreneur is constantly operating at that edge of where they're, where they're, where they are quite literally making things up as they go along. And that imposter syndrome then rears up because you start thinking like, oh my God, people are going to figure out that I don't actually know what I'm doing. And I'm just making this up as you, as I go along. Well, yes, because that's literally the definition, essentially literally the definition or not the definition, but like the job description, the job requirement yeah. of being an entrepreneur is to make it up as you go along. So like, don't, don't worry that people are going to figure out you're, you're an imposter. Like you're not claiming, you know, it all, hopefully you're not claiming, you know, it all. Yeah. And most people get not everybody understands entrepreneurialism, right? But like most people get that as an entrepreneur, you are a creator and you are trying new things and they're not going to hold it against you when that becomes apparent, right? So- yeah, No, absolutely. I know I, I would, that's such, such good points. And um, yeah, no, I would say to people, if you're suffering from that imposter syndrome, hey, listen, I haven't got found out yet. So there you go. <laughs> All right, <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> so you can probably get away with it. Um, uh, the other thing too is it's and and I think a part of this too is sometimes when people step on stage for the first time or Zoom or whatever it is or or the early days, sure. they try to invent a persona, right? They try to yes. invent a character instead of being right. themselves, and right. that's where you often see people where you're looking at them going, "There's something not quite gelling here. Um, there's just something not quite right about this." And I think it's when people instead of being authentic and being themselves, they try to invent an onstage personality. Yeah, well, you know, there's a there's an interesting, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting work around the idea of coming up with an alter ego. And a lot of high performers, particularly sports stars, you know, like uh, Bo Jackson, if you remember Bo Jackson, Bo Jackson has said that Bo Jackson never played a down of professional football. Uh, Bo Jackson's alter ego was was formed around, uh, and I forget the name of the character, but the character in in Halloween, the killer in Halloween, the like one that comes back over and over is that again. Jason, because he was he was uh, he the the killer in Halloween is just like emotionless. Can't there's no way to stop him. He's just a force of nature, and he keeps going. And so for Bo Jackson, he was like, "All right, when I step on the field, I'm going to be that character." Right. So there there's a there's a lot to be said from that for that, but at the same time, it has to authentically gel with like who you yeah. are. Now, when I'm working with my clients, one of the things that I say is you have to prepare to be authentic. And, and one of the things that I stress is that authenticity does not mean coming to the stage and being who you are right in that moment, because <laughs> right in that moment, you might be insecure. You may yeah. have had a, a fight with a loved one and you're all over the place, you, you know, whatever your audience is not paying or, you know, whatever, maybe they're not paying, but we'll use that sure. term. You're not, your audience is not paying to see you at 75% or 50% or 85%. Your audience was paying to see you at a hundred percent. And we all have those hundred percent days. We all have those days where we walk down the street and we're like, wow, the birds are singing and the sun is shining and every glass is not half full. It's like not, you know, 97% full yeah. and I can conquer the world and I can do anything. So that's not inauthentic. We all have those days. We all have those feelings. Remember what you felt like on those days. Remember how you acted when you were having those days. Remember how you projected yourself when you had those days. And then like an actor, embody that character, embody that character of you on your best day. And if you even wanna take it a step further, 
hopefully you're bettering yourself. Hopefully you're investing in coaching or you're, or you're reading books mm-hmm. or, you're, or you're going to university or whatever. Hopefully you're improving yourself. A year from now, you're going to be a better version of yourself. And a year from now, at some point, you're going to have one of those amazing days where you're just completely on fire. Be you a year from now completely on fire. When you come to the stage, embody that person. It's completely authentic because it's you, but it's the best version of yourself. Bring that version to the camera, to the stage, and and don't try to be me or yeah. you know right or 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 anybody else right be yourself but just your best self yeah no i love that point that you just made i just want to underline it is be the best version of yourself don't try and be a a half good version of someone else right um, but be a good a, a, the best version of yourself because i do see sometimes you know people sort of change or they try it's like people who aren't naturally maybe witty you know, suddenly try to throw in these jokes and they're very labored and you think, and you think, no, I'm not coming to see you because you're particularly witty or whatever. You know, I'm coming to see you because maybe you're actually quite a serious person and maybe you have a lot of really interesting things to say. So I'm more interested in the really interesting things. I'm not that interested in you trying to tell me jokes when clearly that's not your forte. Yeah, and I, and I think it, it, the other thing is is, is don't, you know, it's like I, I'm a big baseball fan. And, you know, a lot, a lot of times in, in baseball, you know, hitters will get into a, the problem of like they get into a little bit of a slump. So they think that the way that they get themselves out of a slump is that they have to like swing for the fences every time. And then because they're swinging for the fences every time, they can't hit the ball. Right. Yeah. And, and for public speakers, that can fall into it's like, all right, I know that as a speaker, I have to tell stories. I have to tell tell compelling stories. So let me try to figure out the story where I went shark diving and the sharks had lasers on their heads and I <laughs> like, you know, saved James Bond and whatever, right? And, and I've got the story and it's like, no, like I have a story that I tell all the time on webinars, uh, you know, on podcasts about going to the grocery store. You know, a coach that I work with who, who's, who's, you know, forte is selling from the stage right? He tells a story about getting locked out of his house. Now, mm. these stories are like so mundane, but they fit perfectly with the point, you know, like his fits perfectly with the point that he's trying to make. Mine fits perfectly with the point that I'm trying to make. And they, therefore, they're, they're authentic. They really happen. People can relate to them because everybody's like gone to the grocery store, locked themselves yeah. out of their house, right? Like those are the stories that we need to be telling. Now, if you've done some adventurous things, if you cut, climbed Everest, you can talk about climbing Everest, yeah. but you don't, not every story has to be climbing Everest. Yeah, I know. And I think that's a great point. I mean, unless you have something really spectacular and compelling, it's the relatable stories that people latch on to because they go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's happened to me. Um, yeah, if you've climbed Everest, that's fine. People go, wow, that's amazing. That was an amazing thing to do. But if you haven't, it's the, as you say, the so-called mundane things that are so much more relatable. Yeah. And, and even when you, when you have climbed Everest, I think, I mean, you know, we probably all watched a Ted talk about somebody that has or something and, and probably the points that relate that like really resonated with us, probably the reason that they're on Ted talking about Everest is because probably a good part portion of that story is about them talking about like sitting in the tent the night before the summit scared out of their mind that they were going to fail or like, right. They're, they're yeah. like, they're climbing Everest, but the story is really about some human thing that everybody can relate to. Right. So yeah you know, don't get yourself freaked out about the fact that like, you don't have any great stories or, or you know, so you've got to try to, con- you know, Frankenstein monster, yeah. a bunch of pieces of different stories together to make a good story or whatever, just, you know, find those everyday experiences that relate to what you're trying to talk about. And that will resonate with people and just have con- tell it, you know, like tell it like you yeah. were like you were having a conversation in a coffee shop or at a bar with somebody you just met and you were getting along with and you just having a nice conversation. Yeah, no, perfect. A great, great place to end too, Seth, because I think that's it at the end of the day is like, just have a great conversation with your audience. Yeah, maybe if you're delivering a speech, maybe it's a one-way conversation, but that's okay. But treat it like it's it's a conversation that you're talking right. and don't look, I'm not talking to 150 people, I'm talking to one person. They just happen to be 150 of that one person. That's right. That's right. 
yeah, well, listen, Seth, this conversation. Sorry, you go. can make it a conversation. I mean, in your mind, you make it a conversation. Yeah. And you could ask your audience, even if you know that they can't respond, you can still ask questions, yeah. give them time to think about it. Like, let it be a little bit more of a conversation, right? Even though it's going to be you talking 95% of the time, you can, you can work on that a little bit. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think when I'm talking to 95% of the time, people need a break for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, listen, Seth, uh, this has been great. Uh, all of Seth's information is going to be below this video, uh, so you can find it. But uh, before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself. Sure. So, uh, you know, as John said, my name is Seth Donlan. I am the uh, founder and head coach at Owen Coaching. We are um, a marketing and communications coaching firm that specializes in serving service entrepreneurs, particularly sport and fitness entrepreneurs, um, helping them identify, um, attract, and then connect with their ideal clients so that, you know, ultimately, right, they can, they can grow their business to the level that they want it to be at and not have it be this huge struggle that consumes all of their time, all of their energy, and doesn't allow them to have you know, time with their family, have vacations, have other passions outside their outside their job. So um, if I can help anybody with that, uh, you know, feel free to get in touch. Um, I'm, you know, I love helping. That's why I got into the, into the, you know, coaching and consulting space. So. Yeah. And I'm a big advocate of, uh, of professional coaching for people in their jobs. And that I do think it's something that more people need to consider. Uh, and we can, it's, it's great to have a third party. It's great to have somebody who's on your side, but is independent so they can give you proper feedback and direction. I really highly encourage it. I say to people all the time, you know, you probably spend a lot of money on coaching for your hobbies. How about spending a little money on coaching for the thing that puts bread on your table? Invest in yourself. And the other thing is too, I mean, like, hey, I seek out help. I, you know, I specialize in marketing and communication. I seek out help for my marketing and communication because I'm just mm -hmm. too close to it, right? I make yeah. I make terrible, I mean, not always, but I make terrible decisions for myself. I'm my own worst <laughs> client, right? So I go out and get help, even in the areas that I'm that I'm an expert in. Um, yeah, and so it, it's not it's not at all some kind of admission of weakness or or you know incompetence or something to to go out and get help um, with a even a core area of your business. Yeah. But, you know, if your business is being, a, you know, a whatever, I mean, in my, you know, if your business is being a great triathlete, uh, coach of, of triathletes, you don't have to be an expert in marketing or, or yeah. bookkeeping or whatever else there may be, you know, so, mm. so let, let go get help with that. Absolutely. 100%. Um, listen, thanks again, Seth. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks, John.